regarded as someone who interpreted her people from the vantage point and potentially from the interest uh, of the Dutch colonialists. Now, this placed her in a very ambiguous position. But I want to say, you know, just before I make one or two final remarks in terms of the general history, mm. that what we know of uh, Krakoa uh, is drawn from very limited archives. So uh, when we talk about the history of Krakoa, uh, we know something, but it's written, uh, it, it is taken from the official archives. And we need to remember that those archives were written by the colonial powers, uh, white people, colonialists, and importantly for the history of crypto was written by men. So the way that she has been portrayed in the archives must be understood in terms of those important issues. That her life in the archives, as limited as the archives are, uh, has been rendered from those perspectives. So the way that the men presented her was a woman with loose models. She yeah. became a drunkard. Yeah. Um, they interpreted her as someone who was morally loose, sexually loose, who slept with men, yeah. uh, or with several, uh, there were several white men. Now, uh, it may be that some of those things are true. We, we don't know, we can only surmise from the archives, but we must remember that that rendition is a rendition of her life from the vantage point of the white male gaze. Mm. And therefore, we need to be very careful when we speak about the history of Krakoa as if what, what is in the archive is uncomplicated, is a truth that we must not subject to uh, critical scrutiny. Okay. So, so, uh, yeah. so, so given that play well, uh, around a, a, a quick synopsis of who Krakoa was and, 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 and exactly, you know, how um, you know her, her life had, had, had developed, one, one of the, the key things here in, in this particular film that, that, that tries to portray this particular story um, is one that, you know, Kritawa was, he deals with many of those aspects, but, but he, he begins to, for instance, talk about how, how Kritawa had, uh, had wanted a life on, on both ends. You know, she wanted to be part of the, the, the colonists as, as well as her own people. How, how do we understand the, uh, the, the portrayal of her story in terms of the film? Do, do you think the film accurately d describes what it is that narrative uh, is, uh, that is available of her? So, so I, I think it, uh, it, it only succeeds uh, partially. Um, and it is true uh, that, um, she con that, that she's a woman torn, a child that is torn uh, between uh, her, her community and the life that was forced under in the castle, the fort, uh, and within the emerging colonial population. Uh, and I think that the extent to which uh, the film succeeds in doing this is the way that she performs, uh, and you know, it's pretty easy uh, to poke holes in the narrative and the portrayal and interpretation of the film that tries to cover such a complex history uh, for which there are very limited archives. So, you know, I think we that one has to be careful, but I think that there are some limitations in the way that the film is, uh, uh, does it. And when we look at the critique uh, yeah. of the film um, and, 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 and the views that have come forward, uh, how much, you know, does it does it deal with the actual narrative and the history that we know around Kritoa yes. and, 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 and more so an, an opinion here of, 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 of what we see in that film. For instance, when, when I watched it, um, right, I, I was terribly upset in the manner in which uh, Jan van Riebeek is portrayed. He, he seems yes. to be a very cool, nice-looking white dude, um, you know, that, that, that he's the nicest man, and everyone that followed after him, you know, you know were, were the bad ones, you know, were the ones that did not no, no, no. control. <laughs> How, how can we read that? Right. No, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's, it's almost like, uh, you know, it's a figure from some heroic, uh, you know, movie. Mm. Suave, handsome, and although he, uh, in, in, in the film, but we don't know this uh, historically, um, he rapes Krakoa. But in the end, she also forgives him. Mm. The reality is that I mean, it was a criminal, uh, you know, that was you know, sent as punishment to the Cape. Um, he was hardly this benign character that the film makes him out to be. So in that sense, you know, the film kind of creates this uh, very problematic relationship between Van Riebeek as this kind of benign colonialist. And yet, you know, this was the, uh, um, the, the, uh, the person who's responsible for the initial disposition of the Khoi and the Sand people in the Cape. So this kind of portrayal of him as, this, as you say, cool, handsome character, but it's largely benign. He has this very 
is egregious, uh, you know, uh, incident of raping her co but she forgives him in the end. Mm. Uh, so it's a very, very problematic betrayal, and it's even a thing to, uh, in, 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 in uh, the way I see the film, to, 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 to present this initial uh, benign relationship, notwithstanding the rape between Van Riebeek and Kretoa, and then the, what happened subsequently with Wagenaar. And uh, it was more complex, and certainly, it, uh, for me, what, I, I think like you, I felt deeply offended, I have to say, by, by you know, from the very first image of uh, you know, Van looking over the landscape, this kind of handsome figure, mm. um, and uh, when in fact we know from our own histories uh, that he was not this benign character. Um, so, uh, so, so I think that um, I mean that is one of the uh, fundamental problems with the film, and that of course affects um, how Kretova is portrayed in relationship uh, to, uh, to to Van Riebeek. Mm. Van Riebeek's wife becomes the, um, the, the the kind of problematic character in the relationship uh, between you know Kretova and the Van Riebeek family, whereas Van Riebeek himself is largely uh, you know cast as a benign figure. But I want to say, you know, so, so, so that's on the one side. On the other hand, it's a very limited and I think very problematic portrayal of the Khoi people. Yes. Um, and um, uh, again, you know, I'm very cognizant that in the film one can't give all the new answers, but there's a lot of literature uh, on Khoi history. Uh, and I know that the producers consulted various historians in Cape Town uh, but I think that the, uh, the, the depiction of Khoi society is, is very superficial and does not give us a sense of what Kurtawa was, uh, was losing mm. in being put in the fort. So, you know, all the, um, the images of the Khoi people, uh, in, uh, by the way, almost excludes other women. When they go into the tents, uh, into, the, in, into the, um, the communities, there are hardly any other Khoi women, you know. Yeah. And there's no sense of the so, social makeup, the culture of the Khoi people, etc. Um, and, and it's therefore very problematic. What that means is that Krakoa is kind of disembodied from her community. So she's physically removed, but we don't have a sense of what, what she has left behind, yeah. um, how she was connected to, how she grew up, you know, what kind of cultures were inculcated in her. Uh, and, and, and therefore, this, this, this superficial portrayal of the Khoi of the Khoi community, I think, is very uh, is, is very problematic. Right. At the same time, as I said at the very beginning, uh, I'm, I'm cognizant that the film can't. Uh, it's, it's not a uh, it's not a 500 uh, page uh, history of the Khoi people, mm -hmm. uh, but it could have done uh, considerably better uh, in the way that uh, it portrayed the Khoi people. Right. And, and, and then, you know, I, I suppose for me, I mean, there are many issues that one can raise, but I would say. Uh, you know, uh, one other shortcoming in, in the film is that, you know, a, a, a kind of key moment uh, in this uh, part of our history is the, uh, the first Dutch Koi War of 19, of 1659, 1660, thereabouts. Mm -hmm. And although the film alludes to it, it does not really, uh, uh, this, is, this is a kind of central moment uh, uh, that uh, defines the uh, colonial uh, uh, project uh, in this part of the African continent. Yeah. Um, and and Kretoa's uh, kind of role in that as interpreter, I think, is very shallow. The way that the man is portrayed there is very problematic because he was also an interpreter. Um, and the role that this is kind of key moment, I think, is insufficiently uh, developed in the film because this is really when the disposition of the Khoi people uh, you know, takes on a more violent form, a military intervention, um, which is not adequately uh, uh, engaged with uh, in the folk. So sure. it is also all sorts of kind of um, uh, um, kind of cardboard characters. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, perhaps, perhaps for dramatic effect, but in my mind, if it doesn't succeed in pinpointing this as a pivotal moment, in the uh, uh, in the project of colonisation. So, 
certainly, and I think you know that that is a, a, a very valuable critique. Yeah, that I want to take further. Uh, Prof, thanks so much for your time, Professor Nur Niftahudin, a historian. Uh, they're talking to us about uh, the movie Kritewa and uh, just, just how the story is placed with, within that film. Online now, let's uh, welcome Sylvia Fonilova. She's a producer, journalist, and filmmaker. Uh, she's written a brief critique of the movie, um, and you know she, she spoke about having taken some time to write it because she couldn't process uh, exactly what she saw in that movie just yet. She was, she was terribly upset about, uh, you know, the movie Kretoa and, and the, the, the almost whitewash of history. Yeah? Uh, so, there, good morning and thanks so much for your time. Good morning, Tashrik. Thank you. Okay, we, we've listened to the historian speak there. You know, you, you could go on for, for quite some time and there were several more questions I wanted to ask. But, you know, just, just on Koi culture, yeah, one of the things that, that terribly, uh, you know, perturbed me even five minutes into the movie was, you know, this whole thing about Koi uh, tribes having traded their women. Um, you know, despite other contradictions later that, that highlights, you know, how they value their women quite highly. So, so, so speak to us quickly about your, your overview of the film and, and, and what you think of it. Okay, you know... I, I, as I said on, on Facebook, when I watched the film, I could hardly speak afterwards. We were invited to a premiere and I was there with friends and colleagues. And, you know, as is usual, as we were coming out, everybody was saying to me, what do you think? What do you think? I literally ran away from that movie house because I didn't trust myself to speak at that moment because I felt so emotional. And just recalling it still makes me upset. And then in the weeks that followed, I sat down. Um, I got to, asked by City Press to write that piece, which was in City Press last Sunday, and, and mm. processed the feelings. And the, the overwhelming thing that I come to, Tashrik, is why has this happened? It's happened because the dominant narrative like the economy of my country is still in the hands of white people who and their junior partners and they've learned that they don't have to have overt political power. The covert way of running this country and dictating the agenda is doing them just fine. And, and this anger is our expression of a need to topple this hegemony. And, you know, for me, the movie says much more about the filmmakers than it does about the historical characters that they have mined. Now, for instance, just to step back, I've written three plays and, and a book, and the common thread in, in the stuff that I've done is the neglected histories, our distorted histories, the suppression histories, the damage, the real, real trauma and damage that it does to people when you not only wipe out um, the, 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 you know, large, large groups of, of people, but you also eradicate their history and you reduce them to non-people, one of which is calling them colored. And, and so when I did this research, something that came through very strongly, especially looking at the um, copious material that is available in, available in the Black Lloyd archive at UCT, is that the colonial people who came here, the level of the people who landed here, the mercenaries, the sailors, the riffraff, largely uneducated people, were not equipped to see the sophisticated worldview that our people lived by. The poetry that is contained in the Black Lloyd archive, the philosophy, the spiritual explanations, the folklore, Everything is so sophisticated that it blew me out when I first read that archive because I realized that I have been brought up on an apartheid um, diet of, of such low-level propaganda that I had started to reduce myself to that low level. And what we see in this film is very, very strange artistic choices. As a filmmaker and as a writer, when I sit down, I make an artistic choice. I make a creative choice. What is the status of the characters I'm writing? I go deeply into the history. When I've written about Dulcy September or Richard Reeve or Cabo, a 19th century Bushman visionary, I don't depart too much, especially even when it's fiction like the play I did um, for the stage. I don't depart too much from what happened, and I definitely don't depart when the real story is fascinating. Just one, for instance, when you're writing a, a character like Kratoa and you come to the part where she has descended into alcoholism, you go and you look for the reasons for that. Now, something that one of the historians had written about how Van Riebeek used to feed the children with um 
alcohol and tobacco to pacify them. Now, I mean, it doesn't, you don't have to dig too deep for the reasons for Kritoa's alcoholism. And just that little historic fact you can use as an artist to much more effect than the fantasy that they have concocted. So my my, my feelings and my, my reaction is on several levels. But once I've gone through all of that, they have taken a fascinating historic story and, re and reduced it to a drivel, complete drivel. It is boring. It is long and unending. It can do with a hell of a good editor. And yeah. and at the end of the day, I just thought, well, you I, know... I, I managed to get hold of Roberta Diran. She is the creative producer and director. She now joins us online. She, she's put together the film. Roberta, good morning. Thanks so much for your time. Morning, good morning, good morning, Sylvia. Good morning, Roberta. Sylvia, uh, uh, Roberta, have you reduced um, a, a very fascinating history, um, you know, of Kritoa and the Khoi people to, to mere fantasy and drivel? Well, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult to even talk about that because it's such a long and She wasn't. And after she made the documentary, 
Um, she also drove the feature film. She mm. said we need to do a feature narrative film uh, with, 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 with what we know from the documentary. And then it's open to research. And Kay can explain perfectly well why she made certain choices around the race. You know, at some point we were actually going to um, put the story in a contemporary uh, uh, setting. You know, that was also the basis for the link, uh, that perhaps that was the route to go. And we looked at that quite a lot, to tell the story through the eyes of a young person, um, you know, who is in search of, of their heritage. Um, today, he has certain issues and certain experiences. And by doing that, we to go back in history and to look at this figure of Kutoa. Right. And in the same way that Kay first heard about of, of the term, and what led her to do the research. So, you know, I think it's quite insulting some of the comments that uh, Sylvia and others have made. Uh, for somebody who, you know, has a right as a creative storyteller to go back, uh, uh, you know, in, uh, into the history of, of what she knew and to come up with a creative treatment for a dramatic feature film. Nobody has said what we, we said inspired historical facts. We are saying what we, we created and chose in our imagination to tell the story of is historical facts. Okay, with that, yeah, that, with, we are not with, saying, with that, can we then so, accept? I mean, can we then accept? That, you know, you can argue this, you can argue for, forever, but the fact of the matter is, is that if the cre creative choices were made and creative choices were executed and creative choices were imagined, Okay, so can, can we then say, Roberta, Roberta, can we then say that the film Kretoa that's playing in the cinema at the moment is not an accurate representation of history, more so that it could, in fact, distort the type of history that is available on the Khoi people and on Kretoa herself? I don't think it is a distortion at all, because, you know, it, there's, there's mainly deduction and supposition. Who was there at the time? Who lived there at the time? Very little was written down. Okay. Very and that, and that's an important down. point that you say, so right? you know, Roberta, you know, just on that point, when you say that we have very little information, who wrote it down, who documented it at that early stage. So here's one of my key questions that bothered me terribly, right, is the over-sexualization of Kretoa, and, and you, you deal with the issue of rape and, and so on and so forth, right, but beyond the fact that she, she goes on to marry another white settler, et cetera, et cetera, um, she, for instance, in one of the scenes, is seen to be touching herself, right? Um, where I, I can't seem to find in, 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 in the available research where somebody, and in the film also does not portray uh, her being watched, um, you know, for somebody to have documented that part of the movie. So her touching herself is almost the key artifact here in leading to establish that Karatawa was a loose woman with, with questionable morals. Well, you know, I think that that's, that's, I think that that's a very little translation of what was depicted in the film. Because I know that the objective of Kay at that point was, this is a woman who was coming of age. This is also somebody who must have grown up within uh, Van Riebeek's kind of inner home circle, because she looked, she grew up there, she was taught Dutch by uh, Maria, and various languages by Maria. Plus, she looked after Maria's children. That was why she was taken into the fort. She, she was, that, that was documented as, as a servant to help with Maria's children. So that means that she was living in close proximity of, with this man. Many historians have, have um, you know, deducted or supposed that she was abused. Um, and there's no question about that. So the question is, how do we know she wasn't abused by Van Riebeek? How do we know that? And how awful to be raped by somebody with whom you are familiar and whom you know? That's always the worst type of rape. And we know that in the contemporary uh, 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 the world we live in today, how many women are not raped by somebody known to them? An uncle, a friend, a father. Yeah. Um, this happens. But I, I don't think anybody's uh, contesting whether she was raped by Van Riebeek. I don't think that was a contestation. So when, and 
can I just finish? Sure. That in, in this kind of uh, dramatic uh, construct, in your, when you're uh, creating a narrative, um, you, you need a character. Characters need to develop. They need to start in one place and end in another place. Uh, and also, they also, you know, in terms of Kotoa and what happened to her, she was a victim. She was, she was in a, a situation where she was victimized. And, and, and victimized without power. And that is what he wanted to bring across. And I know that that's what, what Kay wanted to bring across. Right. He did not have the power. Okay. Roberta, we're going to have to leave it here. Thanks so much for, for coming on to Radio 7. I think Roberta, you're on creative producer and director. They're talking to us. Sylvia is still on the other side. Sylvia, so, um, yes. you, you've been sitting very patiently and listening, of course, yeah, to this conversation. Um, I actually want to get back to one of the earlier points that Roberta did make, and that is that, you know, um, the, the writer is a pilot woman. She comes from Bishop Lever. She led the project herself, uh, wrote the, the, the movie, the plays, etc., etc. doesn't matter who... The, the color of the skin and who tells the story. Okay, let's just get the perspective straight here, you know. This is not about Sylvia Vollenhoven and Kay Ann Williams. This is about a much more important issue. And Roberta Durant has to learn the difference between insult versus professional critique. What appeared in City Press on Sunday is my professional critique. What I'm saying here now is my view both as a Khoisan woman and as a professional writer and, and uh, a journalist. Um, the, the thing that we have to understand is that somebody comes out of a certain paradigm. When I worked at the SABC or I've worked with organizations like Media24, there is a predominance of white people who have grown up with privilege and a certain worldview that still dominates in this country. And when you go into those spaces, if you're not super strong, if you're not super confident about who you are and what you stand for, you end up doing their dirty work for them, I'm afraid. And I've seen this happen to great people all around me all the time. And at times I've been in that danger myself. So I understand what happens when you go into those spaces. And I am not saying this lightly. Women like Kay Ann Williams who go into that artistic space do not have the dominant voice. They do not come from the dominant culture. And this kind of script writing and this kind of story that we see is the tragedy, is, is what happens when we go in on their terms and bring out a story doing their dirty work for them. Okay, just on, on one of the questions that I put to Roberta about, you know, she, she makes a critical point about how this, you know, is also an attempt to tell a story where there was no proper documentation about every other event that did take place. And and, 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 and I felt that she didn't quite answer my question here around the over-sexualization of Kritawa in the scene where she is supposedly touching herself and then later is portrayed as, as a woman that, of course, you know, ends up giving from the remit, marries a, a, a colonizer, still wanting to be with, 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 with Durand, which is, of course, one of the chiefs whose character itself, you know, wasn't properly portrayed um, or ideally portrayed uh, in the film itself. How, how do we read this particular um, artifact in the movie? The important thing to remember is that when we are constructing fictional characters, that we construct, if we are good at it, complex characters. What I would have liked to see, of course, Kritoa was a sexual person. We are women, we are sexual people. That is not at issue here. What I would have liked to have seen is a proper construct of a complex character that starts out somewhere and ends up somewhere else. Kritoa starts out on some kind of tepid flat line of being, you know, quite an interesting woman and then ends up as, as an, a mad alcoholic. She doesn't have a complex journey that, that engaged me and fascinated me. And there is enough historic evidence to provide choice bits of information that could have fueled that complexity. The other thing that that, that we should remember as, as professional storytellers is that when you make a creative choice and you decide, okay, these are going to be my high status character, for God's sake, the movie is named after her. She should be a fascinating blockbuster high status character, Helen of Troy high status character. She is not. As I said before, she comes out as damn boring for the most part. And, and then in the end, you know, you don't even understand why she ended up there because there wasn't a trajectory that 
engaged us along the way. The other Khoisan characters that stand out from the other Khoi characters, sorry, are, are Doman and, and Achimao. Achimao was amazing. He had built up a thriving business at the Cape and the historian that spoke before me can, can go into more detail. We don't get that, you know. We don't get how complex these characters were and how fascinating they were. It is not an excuse to say that there was scant histor historic evidence when we don't even use the fantastic evidence that there is. But we mine our own problematic imaginations to come up with something that would have done Van Riebeck and his people proud. How do we undo um, what, what certainly is a, a, a narrative here that is portrayed, um, you know, about Kritawa and Khoisan um, people? Uh, because the, the challenging part about all of this is, is of course, the, the contestation around the narrative and, and the role that Kritawa had played in all of this. Of course, um, you know, in the context of the film, if one looks at this, the historical aspect, uh, you know, for the Khoi, she, she, she seems to have been a, a person that, that portrayed, uh, that, that, that that had portrayed um, herself as as having abandoned her people, um, you know, for for, for 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 the for the Dutch settlers, she she ends up being abandoned. So how do we do we read you know those conflicting narratives here? And and, and the, the conclusion here by the film is that Pratawa was a woman standing um, on her own, abandoned by both people, a drunk, and and of course languished and died on Robben Island. Okay, I have to point out that that all our characters, um, you know, when when we are writing them, whether they, especially if they are heroes, have fatal flaws because human beings have fatal flaws. So of course, so did Kritoa and and so did Jan van Riebeek. Although in this film, I. I find it very hard to recall what Jan van Riebeek's fatal flaws were. So when you write those characters, those things have to be clearly set out. And But when you're writing a hero or a heroine in, in the case of Kritoa, you, those fatal flaws are counterbalanced with what that heroine has achieved. And in, in this case, this woman achieved something incredible. She was taken into this white world dominated by, by men, and she became somebody who, on, on whom they relied. She became somebody important. That speaks so much to her own character. The fact that she is remembered at all in the historic documents and, and that there is so much information about her, I can only imagine that she was a thousand times bigger than, than the snippets we've been left. So, you know, when you write these things, even though it is fiction, you've got to take all that into account. But ultimately, it's about the artistic choice you make. And artistic choices and political choices are intertwined. And it's no use for Roberta to say, yeah, this is just my opinion. It is not my opinion. The political choices and the artistic choices that were made in this country in the past were all belonging to a same kind of paradigm. We need to shift that. And this radio discussion and the discussion around Kritoa is how we are going to shift it. Indeed. Well, we're going to have to leave it there. Sylvia, a pleasure chatting to you as always. Uh, Sylvia Fodenoven, she is a journalist, a producer, filmmaker, and uh, a woman of uh, Hoi, um, you know, uh, she's a descendant of the Hoi people, and uh, talking there to us about the movie Kretoa. I watched it, she watched it, Lulu Tacho did watch it. Roberta Durant um, is a creative producer, director. She put it together, and um, the movie has sparked quite a bit of a debate, um, you know. And uh, the city piece, as noted, they also published, um, you know, a a, a a a review of the film where uh, you know uh, Sylvia Van der Leeuwen and others make the point that the film is a complete whitewash, and there are some, you know, as, as Sylvia mentioned to the end of this discussion, you know, um, there are decisions that you can make even when you put together fiction. So even if it's not a true representation of, uh, you know, the actual artifacts of history, what you then do is still take a conscious decision to portray something in a fictional way, um, to portray and bring across a message. And what that message is in the movie Kretoa is that Jan van Riebeek was this very cool, nice-looking man um, that was treated, you know, everybody very well, and he just simply wanted to live in harmony with everyone, um, which, uh, you know, again, you know, Professor Nur Niftahedin says, is in contradiction with actual historical act artifacts. Um, and then, of course, you know, how Kretoa is portrayed as this loose woman or as a woman that uh, simply, um, you know, was... was 
been pushed aside from both tribes, both from the Khoi and the Dutch, and that uh, she ended up for, forgiving, um, you know, Jan van Riebeek for having raped her in that movie. So, uh, Kretawa is still playing, if you want to go and watch it. I know many people have been calling for a boycott of the movie. I don't think that should be the case, and I'm certainly not trying to make Roberta and others a rich, but I do think go and watch the, mu- the movie and uh, engage in what is indeed a debate around history and narratives, and uh, especially in light of uh, colonialism, which, um, you know, is an appetite by some politicians, you know, to, to sanitize, it seems. Anyway, it's uh, nine minutes before nine o'clock. A bit of an extended debate and discussion this morning. We're going to take a break and uh, we'll read out some of the WhatsApp messages that we received on 786 10 11 12.